conversation about breathing on VO2 max. And uh, I heard of Sean Canaan many, many years ago through Leo Daniel Ryan. And uh, you're very welcome, Sean. You're an Irishman based out in Tala. Just a little bit of background on yourself. Sure, Patrick. Thanks for, thanks for welcoming me. So I am the owner and chief tester of a company called Health Matters. So I set Health Matters up in 2011, where we've gone on now to be, or I am one of the most active and experienced testers in all of Europe. And I'm just about to go over my 20,000 VO2 tests. So um, I've seen a lot, I've done a lot, and I thoroughly enjoy what I do working with a wide variety of clients and athletes over them, 11, nearly 12 years. And I think the conversation that we're going to have is whether, well, first of all, for anybody who is listening, that some people will understand about VO2, but just a little bit about VO2, VO2 max, what influences it? And uh, is it genetic? Is it is it training? Is it, you know, what a little bit of background about it? So VO2 max um, is your gold standard fitness test um, has been available or used to be only available to in hospitals, universities, very time consuming, expensive costs. We brought it into Ireland, what are we talking, nearly 12 years ago. I was working with it in Australia 15 years ago, where it's a lot more accessible to your general public at the moment. Traditionally, still very much so related to sport. So many people will get it done at numerous different times of the year to assess their current fitness levels. We work with, and it's also used as a parameter to enter into some jobs like the police force, the fire brigade, the army, we do work with underwater welders. We do work with clinical trials on the effects of exercise in the Coombe Hospital here. So there's a lot of variety in it, traditionally mostly aimed at sport. Now, within a VO2 test, there is lots of other measurements that we will look at. We'll look at heart rate elevation. We'll look at heart rate recovery. We'll look at training zones. We'll look at thresholds. And obviously, we'll look at oxygen utilization. We'll look at fueling sources, carbohydrate, fat, and a lot of that is massively influenced by how you breathe, what the function of the lungs are like. And to answer the question, can you change your VO2? Absolutely. A lot of genetics has got to play a role in it. But as we know, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. So we can change and manipulate a lot of what we're exposed to with the correct training methods. Good stuff. I like that one. Genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger very good yeah, um, i've heard it a few well, uh, <laughs> few years ago like i said i'm taking that one yeah i know it's good it's good um so there's a number of factors then that are going to influence vo2 is it the ability of the heart to pump is it the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is it in terms of respiratory gas exchange going from the lungs into the blood is it influenced by oxygen delivery from the blood to the working tissues? Um, what are them breaking it down into those factors? There's, a, there, there, there's lots. Right. All, all, all of the above. Um, if we look at the statement in regards to VO2, it stands for volume of oxygen. So it's the content of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body mass. So this is where the real individuality comes in. So the milliliter of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body mass averaged over one minute. So it's always people will come in and we will run them through a test. So let's look at the test, for example, before we go into the actual answer, we can do a VO2 test as a run test, a bike test or a row test. And it's a progressive overload. So starting off at a really low intensity of your given sport and it's a progressive overload. And we'll continue to ramp you up and up and up as long as you can. And that's where we're gonna see that quantity of oxygen demand being brought up, up and up and up until the client can't get to a certain level. When we look at the fractional exchange of gases, the different usages of oxygen, quantity of CO2 production, that's more influencing your energy system utilization. And that's something that I've been absolutely mesmerized by having only recently, and you've mentioned Leo, recently, recently enough, maybe last five, six years, worked with clients where they can manipulate the energy systems and the usage of oxygen a lot more. But VO2 is the volume of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body mass averaged over one minute. And in theory, the higher the VO2, the fitter you are. But remember, having a high VO2 is one thing, using a high VO2 is the next. Is it at some point that you're actually running on air and to the point that you get anaerobic? Is 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 or if I'm just totally misinterpreting it? So this aerobic anaerobic concept. So traditionally, not traditionally, probably a, bit, a much outdated view and something that I would have fallen into the trap of 
speaking about aerobic and anaerobic, aerobic with oxygen, anaerobic without oxygen. We know that's not true. We know we're physically unable as human beings to sustain or function life with no oxygen. What actually happens is when we're aerobic, we use a lot of oxygen. And when we're anaerobic, we just use a bit less. And to get a bit deeper into some numbers, in the air, both where we're sitting right now, there's 20.8% oxygen. When we inhale and exhale, the average usage of oxygen is only about 4% if we look at traditional kind of maybe mouth nose or mouth mouth breathing. And the further and the faster we go into exercise and the more aerobically developed somebody is, they might start to use 5% oxygen, 5.5% oxygen, still keeping them aerobic. And then when the bodies demand, so what are aerobic and anaerobic or energy systems? When the bodies demand for energy or to create ATP goes up, aerobically we start to fail. We can't create this energy solely relying on oxygen utilization. We're gonna need now more anaerobic dominance. So we use more glycogen and we use less oxygen. Now, when we talk about less oxygen, you could be looking at as little as a percentage swing of 0.7 of a percent, 1%. You're still using People at the end of a test, when they're completely anaerobic, fully glycogen reliant, are still using 3.7, 3.8% oxygen. So it's never to say that we're not using oxygen. That's just a wrong statement. But with the introduction of nasal breathing and my analysis that we run during testing, I've seen nasal breeders consume up to 7, 7.5%, even 7.8% oxygen, which is phenomenal. And as a result, their aerobic capacity or aerobic function is gonna last a lot longer. Now, straight away, you might think, well, what difference does that make? Well, if you're aerobic, you're efficient. So if you can run at really high intensities aerobically, you're gonna be a very, very good, efficient endurance athlete. And that's what starts to separate fast, durable athletes than fast, not so durable athletes, because they're just not efficient. And efficiency in sport wins in a lot of issues, in a lot of cases. So the factors then that are going to why nasal breathing then plays a role. Um, okay, we know that during rest, that when we breathe through the nose, the, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood increased by nearly 10% with continuous nasal breathing. We have very few studies on, on during physical exercise because it just doesn't get studied. So we also know with nose breathing that there's going to be an increase of carbon dioxide in the blood because it's not able to leave the body quickly enough. And the increase of carbon dioxide is going to cause hemoglobin, which carries oxygen, to release oxygen more readily to the working muscles. Is this what's playing the role in terms of nasal breathers having a higher VO2 consumption? Um, I think there's too many factors to say yes or no. I think the real big impressive aspect of nasal breathers in sport is the efficiency in terms of that economy to be able to perform. Like we can have an athlete, let's say we have someone that's not a nasal breather come in and score a 72 VO2 max. And then we have a nasal breather that comes in and scores a 63 VO2 max. But if that nasal breather has a much higher aerobic capacity or aerobic function than the non-nasal breather who has a higher VO2, if we put them in an endurance event, that nasal breather is gonna win because they can run much more economical than the non-nasal breather due to numerous different factors. So if we look at this aerobic anaerobic turnover, what starts to be produced massively when we're anaerobic is hydrogen ions, and they slow contraction expansion of muscle down, increasing the risk of injury, cramp, and fatigue. It's gonna delay recovery time in between training sessions. And then the further we go into this anaerobic state, the more oxygen debt development, so to speak, is occurring. Now we're not completely oxygen starved, but the body isn't happy, it's not efficient. So the efficiency aspect and what I've seen with my testing is just the strength and the power of the filtration system or the higher oxygen utilization through the nose has a much, knock, much longer knock-on effect for economy in sport. And then remember as well, the further we go into endurance events, the higher oxygen utilization, the higher quantity of fat burning. So a lot of speak or a lot of talk will be about this increasing your fat max your body's ability to utilize fat during exercise. Now, I'm a massive fan of carbohydrate. I think they play a big role in numerous different factors in performance from brain function to glycolytic demand when we are performing anaerobically. However, when we get 
we get testing, we can do uh, metabolic testing where we look at the utilization of fat as a fuel, where we look at ORQ or OREOR values. And my experience, again, those that are trained nasally and do a lot more nasal breathing have a much better ability to burn body fat. So the fueling aspect of endurance events then become a lot easier to manage. So it's just completely like the picture is just endless in its benefits, in my opinion, as a tester who's experienced with such a wide variety of athletes and clients, but not a lot of people are doing it. No, but Sean, we've been talking about it for 21 years. I wrote a book back in 2003, which is 20 years ago, called Close Your Mouth. And it was only fringe, you know, people kind of the innovators that were really looking into it. And very few people from a sports point of view until 2013, I started writing The Oxygen Advantage. And that was mainly to bring a breathing technique for men for mental health issues. But I understood that maybe men will be more drawn to a breathing technique if I can show it can improve physical and mental performance. It, it's a, uh, why might you think it just hasn't got any research? How come this is, um, because I've tried to ask the question, all of the, the sports medicine scientists in the world, even just in our own little country, Ireland, there has been not one piece of research in Ireland about nose breathing versus mouth breathing during exercise. And I could list many, many benefits, and I'm sure you can too in your own experience of it, yet it's not getting any research. Do, would you have an idea why or what needs to be done? In terms of research, no. In terms of an opinion why people don't do it is because I think there's a massive ego problem in sport. I think people think they're a lot better than what they are. And I also think people are very impatient to develop a completely different journey, procedure, concept that we've ever been taught. And I think we're too quick to not accept what we know could be a massive advantage for someone. And even using my own, my own training, you know, I know when intensity gets higher, nasal breathing is more difficult. Do I know it works? Yes. Do I know the advantage of it? Yes. Have I implemented it strictly where it's going to make me a better athlete? No. Why haven't I done it? Because I haven't dedicated myself to it enough. But I think I think it's that's the problem is that once the awareness, and I speak about it to everybody that comes in, I can see when people are nasal breeders. They don't tell me they're nasal breeders. I look at the data. We look at the fractional exchange of gas and I go, oh, you're a nasal breeder. And they're like, yeah, yeah. I tried to nasal breed there as long as I could until I got to a certain point. So once they get to that certain point, excuse me, I think they're unwilling to still train themselves to get past that point. They just accept, okay, this is the point that's too difficult now. Now I'm going to go nose mouth or now I'm going to go mouth mouth. Off air, I spoke about, like I've only ever had one person. And I remember I've done nearly 20,000 tests. I've only had one person ever complete our full test, nasal breathing. And he's uh, James McManus. He's going to be, the first Irish person to climb Everest without supplementary oxygen. He's training with Leo, one of your original, or who he originally trained with yourself. And he is phenomenal what I've seen him do, but he was the first person completed. Normally, we get a maybe get to maybe a five-minute kilometer, maybe a 440-minute kilometer before somebody will start to go nose-mouth. And then once they go nose-mouth, it's pretty much mouth-mouth within a minute or two. And that's that first turn point, that first once they break down or once they get out of that nose nose it's it's the beginning of the end for them because maybe they're trained to a certain degree to deal with that and then everything breaks down internally and the body just can't deal with what's happening okay i think this is interesting so we'd have to ask the question and what makes an athlete to be able to sustain nose breathing during a complete test and those factors that we would look into and maybe you have your own ideas as well is one is boat score and also we use another test called the maximum breathlessness test. And basically both score is a measurement. It's an indirect measurement of chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide. It's quite an objective test. It's not a perfect test. The maximum breathlessness is a measure of the upper limit of tolerance of breathlessness, both from a psychological, but also from a physiological demand. So if you think of, you know, you're doing a long, long breath hold at some point, that individual has to let go. There's not just a physiological impulse pulse to let go but the air hunger gets too much that he has to or she has to let go so one factor is their bolt so i would have to assume that somebody who can sustain nasal breathing during a vo2 has a bolt score that's 30 to 40 seconds plus 
and an MBT, maximum breathlessness test of about 80 to 100 paces plus. Now, that's trainable, but that's your everyday breathing. The second factor would be is nasal airway. I have a terrible nasal airway. One nostril smaller than the other, I have a deviated septum. So I'm going to be very compromised with trying to sustain nasal breathing. That's why we use nasal dilators. I don't have one here, but we have our own ones. And they help. They're based on the cotton maneuver. So just by putting finger here and here, just, just gently prizing to allow more air in. The third factor would be fitness. But I think a really important factor is training. If an individual continuously breathes through their nose during physical exercise, their body will adapt to the increased chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. In other words, they can tolerate a higher CO2. Now, have you came across some of the studies? I know when I was looking at this back, um, I was looking for papers to see if there was a relationship between chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide and VO2 max. And in the few papers, and some of these papers were going back 40 years, they showed that if you have a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, you've got a lower VO2 max and vice versa. Have you came across that at all in terms yeah. of chemosensitivity? I think the issue with the studies is if we look at trained individuals to grow VO2 max, and if we put it to what you've just said there, so in order for us to become better and more managed nasal breeders, I would imagine the intensity of the given exercise needs to be done at a low or manageable sustainability. So we're not going to be running or cycling or rowing at, at any given high intensity, which in turn isn't going to grow our VO2 max. So there's two very different contributing factors to fitness. If we have this really great VO2, but don't know how to use it, or we have this really high aerobic function and have a low VO2, you're going to perform better. So a lot of the studies that, that you shared with me and that I looked into, we don't know the type of training that the, the individuals were put through. Like if I got any client in now, I could make them, give me, give me 20 weeks with anyone and I could make them significantly more economical. So what do I mean by that? I mean, I could get them to run faster for lower heart rate. I'd get the overall max heart rate lower. I'd get the recovery percentage of heart rate up over one and two minutes. I'd increase aerobic function, we'd increase the body's ability to um, burn body fat, but our VO2 wouldn't grow. If I wanted to get someone in where I wanted to grow their VO2 max, I would go completely away from what I've just spoke about and we'd incorporate much more higher intensity training. And that's what I think happens is if you have untrained individuals coming in to learn to nasal breed for long periods of time in sport, you're not stimulating them enough to create that high VO2. So I'd say them studies are flawed unless we knew exactly the percentages and there's too many contributing factors individuality, aerobic base, sport balance, or sorry, um, sports history, exactly what they were doing, what their base was coming from. But remember, to grow VO2, we want high intensity exercise. If we want to grow economy, we want low intensity exercise. So I would be really interested to see if there was a study done where we actually look at aerobic function over VO2 rather than just VO2 for nasal breeders. And I can tell you the results right now before the study's even done, that those that are going to nasal breed are going to have a significant impact on aerobic development or aerobic function to a point where they're going to be able to run significantly faster by just nasal breeding over a short period of time. And one of, again, James McManus, uh, Leo's client, I've seen Leo consistently develop aerobic function over numerous different times. I'll pull up um, sample reports for all his tests that he's done. I'll just give an example of the time scale on the different tests that he's done with us. So James would have had you one of those VASA, um, what do you call them, the dilators? Is what did you call the nasal dilators? Na nasal dilators. So James would have worked with one of them, you know? Yeah. So he has some phenomenal data and he's increased his ability to perform aerobically for a long, long period of time. Bear with me here one second. I've just lost this file. You're fine. Yeah, it's been it's been a really interesting um journey with him to see just the progress that he's got. And let me see here, we've four sample files. Okay, so from November 22 to July 23, we did four performance tests with with this man. And over that period of time, he increased his VO2. Now remember that wasn't their sole objective at this point but he increased his VO2 by over 
But what was really, really interesting is that over the duration of his test, his economy went up consistently for pretty much the same data on heart rate. So originally at heart rate 141, he turned anaerobic at a certain pace. The following three months later, he turned anaerobic a kilometer an hour faster for one beat lower of his heart rate. In March 23 this year, his anaerobic threshold went up another 0.5 of a kilometer and a percent on gradient. And then our test, our last test we did with him was July. His anaerobic threshold identification point was at 141. So if we look at within a year, he put two kilometers an hour and 1% in gradient for a lower heart rate at threshold. Yeah, it's and phenomenal. All James was doing was nasal breathing, but he was nasal breathing controlled training based on heart rate zones as well, which we'd identified through training. His recovery has gone up by 12% in a minute and has gone up by 16% in two minutes. His overall max heart rate has decreased by seven beats. His length of test has gone up. It's phenomenal what I've seen this man do. Now, James is dedicated. I know that for a fact. And having worked with him prior to working with Leo, what you tell him to do, he does. But And then Leo was obviously a great coach and he has his strength conditioning. Before we did our, 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 our last couple of VO2 tests, we could see that he did kind of breathing practice before he did his test. He used the, the dilator on the nose. We also did metabolic analysis with him and his body's ability to burn body fat in a state of rest. So on a day-to-day -day, had massively increased what's called his ori or value. He was so efficient for much longer durations of um, just day-to-day -day movement and in exercise. So we're looking at less than a year there, but I don't think people are willing to do that because ego plays a role and they're not willing to park their ideas of success but we know it works. You know more than anyone it works. I know as a tester that sees this data day in, day out, just how beneficial it can be for people. I don't know, Sean. I don't know why they don't research it. I really don't. That's. I think that is the problem. I genuinely feel if there was, if a researcher was there, and um, because there's a lot going on with it. Just coming back. So in terms of we have nasal breathing, and of course, when you switch from mouth to nose breathing, air hunger is stronger, and you're you're not going to go with your full work rate intensity for that duration and um, because the air hunger is too strong with nose breathing versus mouth breathing. We also know after a few weeks, maybe six weeks, eight weeks, that the air hunger diminishes and tolerance to carbon dioxide increases. And you spoke about the fraction of oxygen, expired oxygen is less. Now, I'm also wondering about superimposing breath holes during that training. So, we do breath hold training whereby we would take a normal breath in and out through the nose, pinch the nose and hold. And some of them involve sprinting for 40 meters. So it's high intensity. There's a recovery for about 30 seconds before a sprint again, 40 meters on a breath hold, a recovery for 30 seconds. And we do about five to eight reps. Now, normally we do five, five reps to a set. If breath holding was superimposed on nasal breathing training, would that then make a difference to VO2 max? In other words, we're not just reliant on nasal breathing. Is there any role for breath holding in this? To be honest, I don't know. Um, I'm not exposed to it enough to, to be able to give you an answer, but I would imagine with that higher intensity training with the breath holds, it would absolutely stimulate growth in what should be capacity or, or growth of, of VO2 because that higher intensity stuff is going to be what stimulates the growth in VO2. What distance, is it more time or is it distance that you're looking to cover when you're doing the breath hold? Like we know 400 meters or less are gonna be key to stimulate growth in VO2 max. Like generally 400 meters is our goal where we're gonna be smashing them out. 400 meters for people are gonna take a couple of minutes, you know? So 400 meters or less is generally gonna be the biggest stimulating factors for VO2. So with them breath holds, I don't see why it wouldn't work. It depends on the breath holding. You know, if we're working with recreational athletes, we typically go at a lower intensity. Um, if an athlete is well warmed up, we go at high intensity. We do repeated sprint ability. But instead of doing repeated sprints with mouth breathing, we would do it with breath hold. And it's normally 40 meters. Um, the thing about it is as well, there's a very, very small rest or recovery between each rep. And 
So blood gases wouldn't have recovered before you do a repeated sprint again on a breath hold. But we would normally expect the blood oxygen saturation to drop down to about 85%, 80% or even 70%. It's severe hypoxia. Mm. You know, normally if an individual sprints with their mouth closed or if, they're, if they sprint with their mouth open, blood oxygen saturation will drop down to about 95%, maybe 94%. If they sprint with their mouth closed, it might come down to 93, 92%. If you do a breath hold during a sprint, you'll drop it down into the low 80s. Sometimes it's 70s. We don't go want it going below 60s because there's a risk of the body passing out. But I suppose the other factor is that during the lung breath hold, while oxygen is going down, carbon dioxide can't leave the body through the lungs. So carbon dioxide is increasing. And this in turn then is going to, because you, point, you talked about hydrogen ion the last time. So if hydrogen ion is implicated in causing fatigue, if we get the human body during training, we disturb the blood acid base balance. In other words, we lower blood oxygen saturation. There's not enough oxygen getting to the working muscles. The hydrogen ion coming from the working muscles doesn't get oxidized. It associates with pyruvic acid to form lactic acid, then dis dissociates into lactate and hydrogen ion. Now, on the other hand, you have carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide in the blood will form carbonic acid, then it dissociates into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. So you have hydrogen ion coming from the drop to oxygen, and you have hydrogen ion coming from the increase of CO2. And this then will cause adaptations inside the muscle compartment to, to delay lactic acid. So buffering increases such as um, proteins, phosphates, and to a lesser extent bicarbonate. You know, that could be an interesting one as well in terms of VO2. I not sure if it has been tested i don't know i think though like in the background of all of that like the develop of oxidative tissue to mop up this accumulation of byproduct is going to occur with that and then also what i was thinking there is if when you're doing these tests on people with breath holds it'd be really interesting to see if the client or the uh, the body that you're using in the sprint is actually entering their anaerobic state or can we take them into that anaerobic state and make sure they stay in the anaerobic state for the repeated breath holds? I think that would be the key because if we've athletes that are running aerobically in a, in a sprint, then I don't think the negative effects of what we're trying to develop are going to be onset as quick for them. So if you were to, let's say you were to get a group of athletes where you're to test them all, we've clarity on objective in terms of going, okay, X, Y, and Z's heart rate need to be at this before we can actually start the timer of these breath holds. I think that would have more benefit on it. And then obviously the accumulation, as you spoke about, of all these hydrogen ion productions from the, the dual forces or the dual processes will develop, or as we get better, we develop more oxidative tissue to deal with this by productivity accumulation. Okay. There was a, a Brazilian trailer, Luis de Oliveira, and I can't remember who, we, I think it was Mary Decker and a few other people. They were sprinters. He trained them back maybe a decade or more ago. Um, he used to have them sprint and the last 10% of their sprint. So say they were sprinting for four, 400 meters. He would stand on the 360 meter line. And once they seen him, they had to hold their breath for the last 40 meters. Is that kind of in a way what you're pointing to? In other words, sprint to get the heart rate up and yeah. then add the breath toll towards the end, the last 10%. Yeah, I'd imagine so. I'd imagine it, without him knowing I'd yeah, imagine, I'd imagine that's what the theory was. But I wonder, you know? did he know? You know, it's curious, isn't it? Because it's really like what well, that's one of the big mistakes people make when they use generalized formulas or predicted formulas where they should be anaerobic or they should be aerobic. A lot of times people are understimulated or overstimulated. So some people think they're aerobic when they're actually anaerobic. And then you have really good aerobic base building athletes that have a massive aerobic capacity. And when they're doing their anaerobic training, they're not anaerobic. So you find a lot of people get a bit of a plateau. So you have many athletes that come to me say their times aren't getting better. They don't know what's happening. And the reason is, is because they bought into the kind of zone two development. They may be nasal breeders, and then they might be completely understimulated in what they're trying to achieve. So that we do need to make sure that we push them up higher. And that's what I would imagine. That's what was the theory at that point, because without entering that anaerobic state, your anaerobic training is fruitless, really. Okay, so it's really about a mix. It's doing some of the training with nose breathing only. It's doing some of it in superimposing breath holes. And it's doing some of it with mouth breathing at high intensity. 
I think it's I think it's about understanding. So when we or when we would collect data, we can then know individuals aerobic and anaerobic balance, and then programming them based off what they need to do to stimulate. I think is the complete picture. You know, and one of the most famous things I always say is it depends. People say it's my favorite two words. Like there's so many contributing factors to individuality, and that's what makes us so unique. So looking at studies done where we get them to be specifically using their zones to identify them energy systems, understanding what them energy systems cause and understanding our objective for each individual. So what we're trying to achieve. But I think that's really, really interesting. The fact that that fella standing there with 40 meters to go, telling people to hold their nose, you know. Yeah, like I tried do, it. Yeah, we, sorry. We, we do it with our fighters. So I do a lot of work with MMA fighters and boxers. And when we attend training sessions, we'll have them heart rate monitored up. And if they're going through a transition or they're doing a certain, um, what we call the shark tank, where someone is fighting a new opponent every minute. And if, if the heart rate's not at the level that we need them to be, we'll bring in the likes of some pad work for 15 or 20 seconds to get the heart rate up, to get them into that anaerobic state, to create the fatigue for them to manage that opponent better. You know, So it's putting them in a state of absolute uncomfort and making sure they're an ability to deal with it rather than backing away from it or using your opponent to get, if that heart rate drops down too low, then you're in a fight setting, your heart rate's going to be high, it could be adrenaline, endorphins, nerves, whatever it might be. You're pre-exposed to this in a fight and you haven't dealt with it. You're not accumulated to deal with this byproduct and that's when everything goes downhill fast. So I think it's about replicating individuality's ability to use energy systems with a particular type of training to stimulate growth in, in whatever we're trying to achieve, you know? So this is something that you would do in training. So say, for example, you have an MMA fighter and they are training. And if their heart rate isn't high enough, you're going to put them on the pads just to, to elevate their, their heart rate. So you're putting them into that state. Yeah. Yeah. I was working recently enough with a boxer, an Irish boxer, and um, we were having him do breath holds. So, but having him do breath holding at an intensity at which he would experience when he's inside in the ring. And especially adding the breath holds onto maybe the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth round practice round. So in order to make those ad adaptations, so there's something similar. I think another thing that has been forgotten about is breath holding in sports. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of a lot of our audience are international. If they wanted to find out more about what you're talking about, is there a way to do it? What's your website? Or do you have information yeah, that's out there? Sure, look, um, I'm... I'm trying to grow. I try and do a lot of information on Instagram. So our Instagram is at health matters, I or E, or the website is just simply my health matters. .ie. So I, uh, I'm very, I tend to be criticized for how kind I am with my time. I'm happy to talk to people. I'm happy to talk and spread the word about what we try and do and, and the benefits behind what we do. So by all means, reach out to me. My number's on the, on the website. My email is Sean at my health matters. .ie. And if there is questions in relation to anything that we spoke about, please do reach out to me and I'm happy to support and answer in anything that I can. From what you have observed over the last 20,000 clients and in terms of a training protocol that people could bring in, do you see a role? What would you say is the ideal? I know you're, you're very specific and you're saying it depends, but say, for example, in terms of bringing in a training regime, when people, for example, are doing warm ups, should they be doing the warm up with their mouth open, mouth closed? Uh, should people be learning to breathe with functional breathing during rest and during sleep and during physical exercise? I'm just kind of curious in your take there, um, given that you have seen benefits and changes. I think, um, I think it will tie in nicely with one of the biggest issues that I think is prevalent in in all sport and the likes of Peter T is banging the drum about at the moment this zone two or low intensity zone training people don't do enough low intensity training and i think that contributes to many different factors because they're not aerobically developed then and i think the encouragement and from my knowledge i can see the benefits of bringing in nasal breathing and breath holding because i know the background and i know the benefits of it but i think we're fighting a losing battle because ego is too high and we're not willing to do the easy stuff easy and the hard stuff hard. A lot of times the problem with people's training is these days is that 
the easy isn't done easy. So the hard isn't done hard. So they're in the middle of the road on everything. So they're not under or overstimulated. They're just performing badly in all aspects of their training. When we get hold of people and we understand them and we drill home to them that less is more, quality over quantity, I think that's where, okay, we're on a low intensity aerobic day today. We're going to do more nasal breathing. Like I talk about when people are on a zone two day, increasing water consumption, getting more sleep, making sure they're higher quantity of vitamins and minerals in that day. And people are like, oh, no, I'm just going to go for a zone two run, but not change anything else. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. We want your body to be complemented in many different aspects. And if we tie in, so if we think about the bigger picture, we're working with an athlete closely. I'd be like, okay, on these days, we want to do this sort of breath work. On these days, we're going to have to do this. But the buy-in has to be there. The buy-in, unfortunately, I think isn't there. Because again, ego, I think social pressure, I think the likes of some of the apps that we use about our running, where people are putting up Map My Run or Strava or whatever they might be, I think it can be detrimental to people's long-term success because we're too quick to compare ourselves to other people. So if we were to get a hold of people's training block fully and say, okay, this day you do this, but we also need you to breathe that way, I think they have to be joined together. I think that's where the success would come in then. And just coming back to Zen, then zone two, because you're emphasizing it in terms of economy. Um, why aren't people, in other words, what would you say then is the benefit of it versus what they are ordinarily doing? I know you spoke that they're not doing it, but why do it zone two and how much of training? 50%, 40%? 80%, 80%. And this goes across the board. Like we... If you look at training blocks for many people, depending on the, the athletes, they might train between three times a week up to, I have some athletes that train, I don't agree with it, but I have athletes that train up to 12 to 15 times a week. Okay, but when I get athletes like that, that are professional, my job to rein them in and control their sessions and get feedback loops and understand RPE scales and heart rate variability, it becomes a lot more difficult. But the reason we zone two, zone two plays numerous different reasons or no, has a number of different be benefits. Number one thing it's going to do, it's going to increase stroke volume. So it's going to be able to deliver much higher content of oxygenated blood to the working muscle. It's going to deliver and increase the body's ability to utilize fat as a fueling source. It's going to allow for adaptation recovery to occur. I think this is one of the biggest problems in sport today is we don't facilitate adaptation. We don't facilitate growth. We don't facilitate recovery. All we do is push, 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 push. So it's like trying to build a house without a foundation. You build a house without a foundation, it falls down. If we can develop zone two, aerobic capacity, or body's ability to perform at longer or for longer duration at lower intensities, it has a much better effect on all aspects of performance because it will allow you to deliver hard sessions when required. It will allow you to recover, develop that oxidative tissue, and as we spoke about, increase that fractional exchange or develop a better fractional exchange of gas and a better stroke volume. Okay, and those factors also play a role in terms of nose breathing because there's an increase in venous return because of the dive from the increased tidal volume in terms of um, better return to the heart, which will increase um, stroke volume. There's a, probably another factor in terms of stimulating the vagus nerve, improving the sensitivity of the bar reflex. So what you're saying is that recovery really plays a role in an individual's fitness. And it's almost as if you're saying don't overtrain. Overtrain oh. is the worst thing to do. <laughs> I, I bang my head off a wall every single day of the week with regards to overtraining um, and I've had, I'm working with some of my athletes nearly 10 years someone said to me only uh, last week do you know what you were right Sean less is more and I'm thinking it took me 10 years to get you through this concept that less is more if you're doing let's say you're doing seven sessions a week but four of them are really poor quality because you're fatigued and tired well, what's the point we need our easy stuff easy and our hard stuff is hard we don't want our sessions to be six and seven out of 10. I want real clarity. We want three and fours out of 10s and I want nines out of 10s. So do the easy stuff easy, the hard stuff hard. There's a lot of junk miles and there's a lot of junk training done. There's a lot of sessions that are wasted where people are overemphasizing aerobic or anaerobic um, exercise where they'll do sprints on an assault bike but, or they'll go and do an aerobic run, but they do pickups within that aerobic run. I think we have to have real clarity on the days of training, is the session easy? Is the session hard? Are we fueling adequately for it? So when we're anaerobic, have we increased our carbohydrate consumption that day? Are we glycolytically full in order to deliver the force that we need to create ATP? 
although nasal breathing, we will absolutely increase the body's ability to burn fat. We're never, ever going to get away from 100% of using one fuel or the other. Glycogen is needed for many different aspects of performance and life. So it's about 100% to answer the question, we train too hard and we do, don't facilitate growth in numerous aspects of physiological performance, be it uh, the growth of stroke volume, be it the growth of some of the spoke, things you've spoke about there, the vagus nerve stimulation, your body's ability to withstand this hydrogen ion production. If it's always push, 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 it's only a matter of time before it breaks down. And I see it time and time and time and time again. Now look, obviously people that turn smart get injured as well, but a lot of the time as well, remember what comes with this is gonna be irritability, loss of sex drive, red syndrome, female lose her cycle, brain fog, uh, poor performance in work, poor performance in your relationships. When I get people in and I get them to zone two and they buy into it, the feedback I get from this stuff is phenomenal in regards to not only changing their sporting performance, but changing their life, where their partner might say it to them, their kids might say it to them, their boss might be aware of it. They might find that work productivity goes up. And it all boils down to there's so many contributing factors as to why overtraining causes the issues. Is it because there's too much or to this overproduction of byproduct? Is it because they're not allowing facilitation? Is it because stroke volume is poor? Is it because you're fatigued? Remember, the higher we exercise, the more calories we expel. The higher the VO2, the more calories we expel. Are you consistently under fuel? People think that as long as their weight isn't dropping, they're fueling okay. When realistically, you could be looking at between 1,000 to 1,200 calories of someone that's under fueled but not losing weight. So like it's just there's so much going on in sport. And one of my jobs is to play devil's advocate. I critically evaluate everyone that sits in this room across from me. I'm very blunt, I'm very harsh, but that's my job is because people are too, I think they're also too kind to themselves and they don't realistically put a place in where their goal is and to what they're doing. We just repeatedly do the same thing. And if it's wrong, we don't know. Repeating the same thing and expecting a different result is gonna be the first sign of madness. But when we do that in our training, people don't look at it. Like when people come in and go, my marathon time's not decreasing. Oh, you're running too fast. What do you mean you're running too fast? How does slowing down increase my marathon pace? Because it facilitates growth in aerobic function and development of force more economically. And the buy-in, or you have a, a runner that comes in that wants to do a fast 5K. I'm like, you're doing seven fast 5Ks a week. Let's take three of them out and let's make the four of them really good and the other three days much easier. And then everything starts to move the right way. You know, it's just constant feedback of the results. But you'll also have the other side of it where the people won't listen to you and they won't get better. And I'm not one to say I told you so, but I'm always willing when people come back to me and say, look, Sean, you were right. Can I go in and change this? Absolutely, 100% you can. And I never want anyone to fail. But when I know when I'm met with resistance, when people think they're significantly better than what they are, it, it, it doesn't happen. And one of the worst ones for it, I'm just thinking of examples here in my head, is field sport athletes. So if we look at field sport athletes, we know based on a recent study done that in GAA, female GAA, every 22 seconds, there's an anaerobic demand. So for 38 seconds, you're aerobic. But aerobic development isn't trained in most field sport athletes. It's only line runs, bronco shuttle runs, anaerobic push. And the point that I make a lot of the time is that the players need to take personal responsibility. There's no need for a field sport athlete to be going chasing a 5K PB every second night when he's doing Broncos and line runs with the club or she's doing Broncos and line runs with the club. Why don't go out and run aerobically and develop that aerobic function so you increase your durability, you increase your decrease the risk of injury, increase your recovery time. We worked with a, a club uh, January 22. A coach approached me and said, I want you to do a full VO2 analysis on the team and give me the feedback and make sure he had bought into it. He'd worked with me previously. So January last year, we tested a panel of GA male um, male team. I think we did 37 or 38 VO2 tests. Some of the guys were so poorly aerobically developed that they were turning anaerobically walking at a fast pace. And the biggest complaint from this club was biggest amount of injuries. They always got injured. They never progressed in championship and they always fell away in the latter stages of a game, 10 or 15 minutes. So for six weeks, they were not allowed to do any anaerobic, any anaerobic training. So it was just aerobic development, strength, tactics. They did a bit of psychology. 
they didn't do uh, breath work to my knowledge, but they developed this aerobic capacity. They went the furthest in championship. They got the lowest quantity of injuries they've ever got since the club was developed. And they blew teams away in the last 15 minutes. And all that boiled down to was aerobic development. Imagine if we added in the nasal breathing aspect to that to grow that even further. So that's where the concept comes in. Less is more. But again, I, that's a question. Like you're questioning why there's not so much emphasis on nasal breathing development. I don't understand why there's not much more of a push on low intensity training to complement high, high intensity performance. Sean, I have to say, I, I'm pretty blown over by this conversation. I wasn't expecting it to take this route to the talk. Um, like a lot of what you're talking about, I'm looking at it from a breathing point of view because I don't, I'm not so aware of your work and what you're mm -hmm. giving. Like it's, it's almost that it's meeting in the middle. You know, we talk about injury, functional breathing versus functional movement. You can't have functional movement if you don't have functional breathing. Like the diaphragm is not just for respiration. Yeah. It's providing stabilization for the spine. We also know if an athlete's everyday breathing is poor, they are more likely to go anaerobic. And the reason being is because there's a reduced gas exchange from the lungs to the blood, but there's a reduced oxygen delivery from the blood to the tissues. And all of that can be changed. And I can only think about, and then you're talking about recovery. And I'm thinking about then athletes, say rugby players, who might have sleep disorder breathing and obstructive sleep apnea. They're stopping breathing during sleep. They're putting into this increased sympathetic drive. So their autonomic nervous system is in this state. And if they add then training on top of it, and ultimately the body at some point says enough is enough. And you see burnout and you see chronic fatigue with athletes. So in a way, what you're saying is that chronic fatigue, and I've come across it, but I'm sure you've come across it many, many more times. It could be avoided in athletes if oh, athletes. A hundred percent. Like I, again, another example, I had a, um, an amateur, an amateur MMA athlete who was um, the guys in the ISI, the Irish Strength Institute, were working with him. And one of the things that they spoke about was his guard. He couldn't hold his guard up after round one. So this fella had real good ability, real great performance, has all the skills to make it to the top level. And they rang his dad, I don't know what's going wrong. We went, we sent him for this, this, and this. And I said, it's simple. He's aerobically underdeveloped. So he's turning anaerobic too early. And the effects of the ions on the contraction expansion of muscle are making them drop the guard. And I got him in, got to meet him, really nice fella, bought into it. Like, I mean, whatever I said, he did. And I spoke to him recently enough. I've done multiple tests with him. I said, well, what, how, how's the fatigue in the arms and all? And he went, you know what, Sean? I completely forgot about that. that. That's a distant memory. But one of the things he spoke to me about was his chronic fatigue. He spoke to me about the demands of the sport and how shattered he was towards the latter stages of the week gone gone because what we did is we managed load we managed the demand on the body for performance we deliver when we need to deliver but we also facilitate recovery adaptation and growth when we need to because without them as you've said and i've said you're gonna break down we can prevent anybody can prevent it if they're willing to understand the needs of their body and it mightn't be anything that's deliberate we, we enter sport as an example, and we just think we have a, a right to be able to do whatever we want to do without correct training. So if I wanted to go and run, and I had a client just before we did this conversation, I had a client, she's never ran before. She said she wants to do a marathon in April. And I says, well, what are you doing? Like, are you doing any long runs? And I'm just fast 5Ks, five, fast, fast kilometers. And I was like, why? You just don't to fatigue yourself. You need to get development. And when we identify aerobic underdevelopment or overemphasis on anaerobic onset, that's the issue. But it takes time. It takes it can take 12 to 20 weeks for us to get a growth in 10% on aerobic function. It depends on the buy-in. It depends on the willingness to work. But like we take it back to that GAA team, there was three or four of the lads that I had to get them to walk for 30 minutes on the pitch, in their boots, doing laps. I said, you're not allowed to run. You're just not allowed to run. And by the end of the six weeks, they were into a light jog. But then when we retested them, their aerobic function had gone up massively. So they developed this massive aerobic ability to perform. And again, as you said, injuries dropped off. And it's really interesting on the chronic fatigue. I love what I do, how it affects people's life out of sport. I love that feedback. 
You know what I mean? People are ringing me saying, I cannot believe my sex drive. I cannot believe the work productivity. I can't believe how less irritable I am with the kids. I used to be snapping a lot more. It's because there's so many things going on and add in under fueling in regards to actual caloric requirements for individuals. It can make a massive difference. And it's like, I can't, you can't drive a car with no petrol. You can't drive with no oil and no water, no air in your tires. And that's why there's so many contributing factors to individual life. And that's why we deal with people on an individual level and make recommendations based on what we were presented with. But I think people are unaware of this aspect of performance in sport because we all just think we're a lot better than what we are. Or if we look back at the type of training that we've done, we've done no aerobic development. I personally believe aerobic training, aerobic development, or aerobic conditioning comp complements every single sport in the world. Like I, oh. I just... There's nothing I don't think it helps. So for somebody who's putting in this type of training, then where are you looking to see their heart rate? Is it going to be based on age or are you looking between no. 120 and 140? No. Or... No. So this is this is something that we have to be really, really clear on. Me sitting here right now, I cannot tell anyone what their heart rate should be unless we test them. So use me as an example. I have a really low heart rate. I can run four minute, 30 kilometers, a heart rate 120. My max heart rate is 160. I have an older brother who was a competitive butterfly swimmer for many years. He's a max heart rate of 210. We share the same parents. We share the same DNA. We're exposed completely different. Another example, my daughter was born naturally, or sorry, my son was born naturally. My daughter was an emergency C-section. She has a much higher heart rate than he does because she was exposed to an environment of stress when she came in. So that vagus nerve is going to have a response where we're going to have a higher heart rate. So this is where mistake number one comes in, where everybody starts to run off a formula, 220 minus her age, 180 minus her age, uh, a max 100 meter sprint, subscribe 30 multiplied by 0.75. And when people come into me and go, I'm always in the red zone, Sean, um, my straightaway answer is you're not. I know you're not because you wouldn't be here if you were. Or I can never. So when I use them formulas, I'm overtrained. So feedback for me is you're understimulated, you're undertrained. I know exactly where I am because I have frequent ability to test. But the a lot of times people will use formulas that have them overtrained as well. So someone could have a really low heart rate, but this parameter or this zone that's been created using an algorithm has them consistently anaerobic. When realistically they say, I can never get into them zone. My coach says I'm not pushing hard enough. The, the gym coach or my management team say I'm not training hard enough when they're absolutely shattered. So unfortunately, and this isn't a business push, this is for anyone that is serious about heart rate training, I would say, go get a test done. You can do VO2 testing, you can do lactate testing, you can do ventilatory testing. There's lots of different tests out there, but get the objective and get the clarity on your zones. The reason why we do so many tests a week is for to get this in. Everybody that I'll see today, majority of people I'll see today, all they're looking for is their zones to get clarity on exactly what they're looking for. And the mistake, and I see it time and time again with the likes of influencers that are, are not influencers, people that have decent accounts that will just throw a number out there and say, all right, you go and run at 120 or go and run at 140. If I'm running at 140, I'm running sub four minute kilometers. I have a client today that started the test at 100 BPM. She was walking at four, four kilometers an hour. So there's just... And it boils back to saying it depends. Unfortunately, getting your parameters and your zones identified as early as you can on, on a fitness journey is, is very important. And remember your zone too as well. That's where we're going to decrease risk all cause mortality. That's where we're going to have improve our cardiovascular health, 90 minutes a week, that type of thing. One of the mistakes people make is they say, I'm not going to get a test done until I'm at my peak fitness. And I said, why? What's that going to show you? That's going to show your VO2 max. So that's going to nourish your ego. That's going to complement or push your ego. It's going to do nothing for your performance. My, my statement on that is when people say, oh, I'm just going to get a base in. Well, if you get into me as quick as you possibly can, and we'll get your base built a lot faster than you would have if you just built it yourself. Because you're, you're training against your body unless you get your zones identified. Unconscious of time, I've got a couple more questions. One is in terms of mental health. Um, an individual who comes into you and 
we would say somebody who has a perfectionist tendency is sort of setting high psychological demands on themselves. They've got a lot, little bit of anxiety or maybe racing mind. Do you see a difference there positively or negatively under trainings? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've seen, I've seen people like people have told me have changed their life. I was in, uh, we were in a bill, uh, we do a bit of work in Apple in Cork and we had a guy come up to us. We were there last week for the last visit of the year. And he came up and said, you guys have changed my life. And we brought, by just bringing in this zone to awareness. That's all it was. It was, it was nothing else. Yeah. And I said, no, you, you changed your life. I just told you what to do. It's amazing. But Sean, I see it in the breathing world that people are going for the extremes in terms of breathing. And we have been saying it, that we have to tailor breathing exercise according to the age of the person, their state of health, and their existing breathing patterns. And you were doing similar, and you've yeah. got the metrics in terms of sports. Yeah. You see the dangers. But society doesn't always, oftentimes what society is going to do is they're going to go for the 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 spectacle, the one that looks the biggest and the best, best and the boldest and the one that's shared most on social media. It's kind of boring um, yeah. to have boring. somebody do, say, light breathing because there's nothing to see. And it's likely boring if somebody is doing a slow jog or even a walk when you've got those young lads. And um, for those people, GAA is um, that's Irish. It's it's Gaelic hurling and football. And um, so those of you who didn't know what sorry, G- GAA meant. Um, look, it <laughs> look it up and look up the game of hurling as well as the best yeah. for me it's the best game of the world um so yeah so sean it's been a pleasure talking to you just finally as well so for people looking for your information your in- instagram it, at health matters i or e and then the website is my health matters dot i e and my email is sean at my health matters dot i e please do reach out Give us a follow on Instagram, engage in the content. We do a lot of educational reels up there in relation to sport performance. So feel free to engage in them and ask me any questions that you may that you may have. That's and one thing to finish up though on that last note, as you mentioned there, the low intensity stuff for the breeding is, is considered boring. It's not sexy. And that's the problem. You know, low intensity training isn't sexy and coming home after a long run with not a lot of sweat and being able to proceed through your day unharmed or have no ill effects isn't considered considered to be training properly when realistically that's what a lot of people are missing out on there's a power in it though no for sure it's been a pleasure thanks very much sean thank you very much